Hello! I'm just as pleased as can be that you're with me again. This is day number 103, and we're going to read Deuteronomy 21 and 22, Psalm 60, and Acts 14. Let's take courage in our God today. And now let's open to Deuteronomy 21. Yesterday we heard an example of why cities of refuge were needed, and we heard interesting rules concerning war. It's good to remember that our sovereign creator God had already determined that the people groups in the land were utterly evil and should be destroyed. Deuteronomy 21 When you are in the land the Lord your God is giving you, someone may be found murdered in a field, and you don't know who committed the murder. In such a case, your elders and judges must measure the distance from the site of the crime to the nearby towns. When the nearest town has been determined, that town's elders must select from the herd a heifer that has never been trained or yoked to a plow. They must lead it down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and that has a stream running through it. There in the valley they must break the heifer's neck. Then the Levitical priests must step forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister before him and to pronounce blessings in the Lord's name. They are to decide all legal and criminal cases." The elders of the town must wash their hands over the heifer whose neck has been broken. Then they must say, Our hands did not shed this person's blood, nor did we see it happen. O Lord, forgive our people Israel, whom you have redeemed. Do not charge your people with guilt of murdering an innocent person. Then they will be absolved of the guilt of this person's blood. By following these instructions, you will do what is right in the Lord's sight and will cleanse the guilt of murder from your community. Suppose you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you take some of them as captives. And suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you are attracted to her and want to marry her. If this happens, you may take her to your home, where she must shave her head, cut her nails, and change the clothes she was wearing when she was captured. She will stay in your home, but let her mourn for her father and mother for a full month. Then you may marry her, and you will be her husband, and she will be your wife. But if you marry her, and she does not please you, you must let her go free." You may not sell her or treat her as a slave, for you have humiliated her. Suppose a man has two wives, but he loves one and not the other, and both have given him sons. And suppose the firstborn son is the son of the wife he does not love. When the man decides his inheritance, he may not give the larger inheritance to his younger son, the son of the wife he loves, as if he were his firstborn son. He must recognize the rights of his oldest son, the son of the wife he does not love, by giving him a double portion. He is the first son of his father's virility, and the rights of the firstborn belong to him. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. In such a case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the town must stone him to death. In this way you will purge this evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. 
you must bury the body that same day, for anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this way you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. Deuteronomy 22 If you see your neighbor's ox or sheep or goat wandering away, don't ignore your responsibility. Take it back to its owner. If its owner does not live nearby and you don't know who the owner is, take it to your place and keep it until the owner comes looking for it. Then you must return it. Do the same if you find your neighbor's donkey, clothing, or anything else your neighbor loses. Don't ignore your responsibility. If you see that your neighbor's donkey or ox has collapsed on the road, do not look the other way. Go and help your neighbor get it back on its feet. A woman must not put on men's clothing, and a man must not wear women's clothing. Anyone who does this is detestable in the sight of the Lord your God. If you happen to find a bird's nest in a tree or on the ground, and there are young ones or eggs in it with the mother sitting in the nest, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but let the mother go, so that you may prosper and enjoy a long life. When you build a new house, you must build a railing around the edge of its flat roof. That way you will not be considered guilty of murder if someone falls from the roof. You must not plant any other crop between the rows of your vineyard. If you do, you are forbidden to use either the grapes from the vineyard or the other crop. You must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. You must not wear clothing made of wool and linen woven together. You must put four tassels on the hem of your cloak with which you cover yourself, one on the front back and sides. Suppose a man marries a woman, but after sleeping with her, he turns against her and publicly accuses her of shameful conduct, saying, When I married this woman, I discovered she was not a virgin. Then the woman's father and mother must bring the proof of her virginity to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. Her father must say to them, I gave my daughter to this man to be his wife, and now he has turned against her. He has accused her of shameful conduct, saying, I discovered that your daughter was not a virgin. But here is the proof of my daughter's virginity. Then they must spread her bedsheet before the elders. The elders must take the man and punish him. They must fine him one hundred pieces of silver which he must pay to the woman's father, because he publicly accused a virgin of Israel of shameful conduct. The woman will then remain the man's wife, and he may never divorce her. But suppose the man's accusations are true, and he can show that she was not a virgin. The woman must be taken to the door of her father's home, and there the men of the town must stone her to death for she committed a disgraceful crime in Israel by being promiscuous while living in her parents' home. In this way you will purge this evil from among you. If a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. In this way you will purge Israel of such evil. Suppose a man meets a young woman, a virgin, who is engaged to be married, and he has sexual intercourse with her. If this happens within a town, you must take both of them to the gates of the town and stone them to death. The woman is guilty because she did not scream for help. The man must die because he violated another man's wife. In this way you will purge this evil from among you. 
But if the man meets the engaged woman out in the country and he rapes her, then only the man must die. Do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no crime worthy of death. She is as innocent as a murder victim. Since the man raped her out in the country, it must be assumed that she screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. Suppose a man has intercourse with a young woman who is a virgin but is not engaged to be married. If they are discovered, he must pay her father fifty pieces of silver. Then he must marry the young woman because he violated her, and he may never divorce her as long as he lives. A man is not to marry his father's former wife, for this would violate his father. Let's turn now to Psalm 60. This poem is again based on David's experiences. I think that this psalm must show how David prayed before the victories mentioned in the rabbinical title. Psalm 60 For the choir director, a psalm of David useful for teaching regarding the time David fought Aram Naharaim and Aram Zobah, and Joab returned and killed twelve thousand Edomites in the Valley of Salt, to be sung to the tune Lily of the Testimony. You have rejected us, O God, and broken our defenses. You have been angry with us, now restore us to your favor. You have shaken our land and split it open. Oh, seal the cracks, for the land trembles. You have been very hard on us, making us drink wine that sent us reeling. But you have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. Now rescue your beloved people, answer and save us by your power. O God, you have promised this by your holiness. I will divide up Shechem with joy, I will measure out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh too. Ephraim, my helmet, will produce my warriors, and Judah, my scepter, will produce my kings. But Moab, my washbasin, will become my servant, and I will wipe my feet on Edom and shout in triumph over Philistia. Who will bring me into the fortified city? Who will bring me victory over Edom? Have you rejected us, O God? Will you no longer march with our armies? O please help us against our enemies, for all human help is useless. With your help, O God, we will do mighty things, for you will trample down our foes. Let's turn now to Acts 14. In chapter 13, we completed the story of Paul and Barnabas's short but successful ministry in Pisidian Antioch. They were too successful, so were run out of town. This is just the first time that will happen. Acts 14 The same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. But the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord and the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. 
Then a mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. When the apostles learned of it, they fled to the region of Lycaonia, to the towns of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding areas, and there they preached the good news. While they were in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him with a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, These men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus, and that Paul was Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town, so the priests of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings, just like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. In the past he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derbe. After preaching the good news in Derbe and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue believing in Christ, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church, With prayer and fasting they surrendered the elders over to the care of the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. Then they traveled back through Pisidia to Pamphylia. They preached the word in Perga, then went down to Atalia. Finally they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of belief to the Gentiles too. And they stayed there with the believers for a long time. On this trip, I have been reading a book by Ravi Zacharias, which is called Why Jesus? It strikes me here, and I'm sure you noticed also how quickly the people of Lystra turned from thinking that Paul and Barnabas were gods to stoning them when they realized they were human. In spite of Paul doing an amazing miracle in their midst, their eyes were blinded. And in the book of uh, Ravi Zacharias, I see that in America, in the West in general, we have been just as blind, amazingly, incredibly, America has given up its spiritual moorings 
to search for an individual spirituality that has no basis in anything, no basis of truth, and it can be demonstrated so. It is incredible that if some of the same gurus who teach these things taught them in their own native India or eastern countries, they would be opposed and shown to be frauds. Whereas in America, we accept anything without question, especially if it comes from the East. How silly. It is my great pleasure to invite you to pray with me. Thank you, my friend, for listening today. O oh Lord God, it is true you are the living one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. O oh Lord, you have not left any people without a witness. And yet you do allow people to become so blind, especially when they turn away from you on purpose. O oh Lord, we pray for your mercy Mercy for the people in America who have lost their way. Lord, it is true also, as Paul encouraged the believers, that we must suffer many hardships before we enter the kingdom of God. And we pray for every fellow believer now who is sick or who is persecuted, who is suffering because of deeds done by others, who is in a position of weakness, who is poor. Lord, in all of our suffering, in all of our circumstances, in every persecution, we pray that we would rely on you, that you would encircle us with your arms, that you would show us that you understand and that you care. And Lord, when possible, please deliver us. As you did Israel's armies, we pray that you would be with us, that you would defeat our foes, that you would, even through suffering and persecution or whatever hardship, that you would allow us to be victorious because of following Christ Jesus.